Pyrrhus of Epirus, killed in action in 272 BCE. Twice king of Epirus, twice king of Macedon, and once the king of Sicily, Pyrrhus of Epirus had a long and storied career. Pyrrhus did not campaign alongside his famous cousin Alexander the Great. In fact, he was not born until several years after Alexander's death. Nor was Pyrrhus a Macedonian, an ethnic identity that was extraordinarily useful for navigating the post-Alexander world. Further, while Pyrrhus is one of the most famous men of this era, his primary claim to fame stems not from his efforts to take up the mantle of Alexander, but rather from his trio of battles against the Roman Republic. Yet, if we try to understand Pyrrhus in his own terms by judging the available literary evidence and his actions, it is clear that he self-identified as a successor. It is also clear that from his perspective, the primary significance of his own life were his struggles to gain and retain the thrones of Epirus and Macedon. Fortunately, modern historians who wish to learn more about Pyrrhus's career have Plutarch's Life of Pyrrhus, an excellent and detailed account of his life and times, which is among the best of all Plutarch's biographies from a historical perspective. Of course, like all Plutarchan biographies, it has its shortcomings, and I will try to address those as we go along by supplementing with information from other sources. Pyrrhus's family, the Molossian dynasty, established its rule over Epirus by around 370 BCE. When Alexander I of Epirus, the uncle of Alexander the Great, died trying to carve out an empire in eastern Italy in 331, the throne passed to his cousin, Iosides. Iosides was a minor, and his government was effectively managed by his cousins Olympias and Cleopatra, the mother and sister of Alexander the Great. Iosides married Pythia, the daughter of Menon of Pharsalus, one of the most prominent families in Thessaly. During the Lemian War of 323-322, Menon had thrown in his lot with the Athenians and tried to throw off the Macedonian yoke. Iosides and Pythia had two daughters, Didamia and Troyas, and one son, Pyrrhus. The birth order for the children is unclear, especially since Troyas is an obscure figure who may very well have not survived her childhood. Pyrrhus was born in 319 or 318, right around the time that the Peace of Triparadisus broke down and the Second War of the Successors broke out. This period was a time of chaos, exactly the right time to live if you were an ambitious warrior king who thrived on turmoil the way that Pyrrhus did. As Alexander's cousin in an age of Argead scarcity, Pyrrhus was able to draw on his maternal kinship to the great conqueror at various moments in his career when he vied for the Macedonian throne. However, as he found out the hard way, Pyrrhus's relationship to Alexander did not get him very far since he was still not a Macedonian and his power base in Epirus was insufficiently powerful to sustain his ambitions. The Second War of the Successors began as a succession dispute over the Regency and over Macedon between Antipater's chosen successor Polyperchon and Antipater's oldest living son Cassander. In previous videos, we have looked at how the succession struggle spilled over into a general conflict engulfing nearly the entirety of Alexander's conquest. What we have overlooked up to this point is the impact that the Wars of the Successors had on Epirus itself. Without the conquest of Alexander the Great, Alexander the Molossian would not have gotten himself killed in Italy trying to emulate his nephew's deeds. Had Alexander I of Epirus not died at Pandosia, his cousin Iosides would not have ascended the throne and Pyrrhus would not have been born as the heir apparent. From 323 to 318 BCE, Olympias and the Epirote relatives of Alexander had stayed out of the succession squabble partly for lack of a claim to an explicitly Macedonian empire, and partly from lack of a military means with which to challenge Antipater and others. When he found himself unable to defeat Cassander, Polyperchon reached out to Olympias, who had been living in Epirus for years, for aid, and he offered her a share in the regency for her grandson, Alexander IV. Olympias was able to persuade her young cousin Iosides to lend his army to her, and she returned to Macedon in 317. 
After a dramatic confrontation with Adia and Philip III, Olympias's presence caused mass defections among the enemy and she was able to establish herself alongside of Polyperchon. However, rather than reaping a reward for his conduct in this conflict, Iosides soon found that he had made powerful internal enemies and earned the hatred of Cassander, who turned out to be a formidable foe. It would appear that the Epirote aristocracy resented strong monarchs who wanted to pursue centralization or otherwise do things that would strengthen the kingdom at the expense of their personal prerogatives. Iosides, like his predecessor, was struck with the Alexander fever and seemed likely to imitate Macedonian patterns of development. As was the case in Macedon before Philip II's reforms, the Epirote norm was for the powerful to overthrow and replace Molossian kings who overreached with members of the dynasty who were more pliable. The fundamental instability of the Molossian throne would prove to be a millstone around the necks of both Iosides and his more famous son Pyrrhus throughout their lives. By 316, Olympias had squandered whatever goodwill she had had upon her initial return by initiating brutal purges in Macedon. When Cassander returned from Greece, he was able to trap Olympias and her army at Pydna. Determined to rescue his cousin and mentor, Iosides mobilized his army and prepared to set out to break the siege lines. However, before he got underway, Iosides was violently ousted by a coup and replaced with his young cousin, Neoptolemus II, a minor who would serve as a Macedonian puppet. The conspirators intended to murder the royal family. When the coup began, young Pyrrhus was not with his parents. Iosides escaped separately, unable to look after his son's well-being. Luckily for Pyrrhus, his personal servants were able to keep him safe and enlist the aid of some kindly locals who helped get the child across a swollen river. Pyrrhus's protectors took him to Illyria, where the wife of King Glaucius was Beroea, a woman of the Molossian house. At first, Glaucius was hesitant to accept Pyrrhus into his court for fear of antagonizing Cassander, who had supported the coup in Epirus. Plutarch says that Glaucius was against taking Pyrrhus in, but he was won over when he saw the boy crawl over to an altar and pull himself up on it in a way that seemed like an omen. It is unclear whether Glaucius saw some religious significance in this, or whether he simply found the child cute. Pyrrhus was raised alongside of the children of Glaucius and Beroea. Some time later, when Cassander offered Glaucius 200 talents to turn over Pyrrhus, Glaucius refused. The Illyrians were arguably the roughest and toughest people in the Balkans, and it is quite likely that much of Pyrrhus's later resilience and personal skill at arms owed to spending so much of his boyhood being raised in such a warrior culture. Iosides' whereabouts and activities for the years 316 to 313 are unknown, but it does not appear that he traveled to Illyria with his son. In 313, an Epirote faction invited him home, having soured on Cassander. That year, Iosides ousted Neoptolemus II and led Epirus in a war against Macedon. Cassander dispatched his brother Philip with an army to restore Neoptolemus. Due to the rapid development of this war and the obvious dangers involved, it is almost certainly the case that Pyrrhus remained in Illyria and was not reunited with his father during his second reign in Epirus. The same time constraints also made it unlikely that Iosides was able to venture north to visit his son, who was now six or seven years old. In the first battle, Iosides was defeated, but he was able to regroup and hazard a second battle. During the second battle, however, Iosides was killed in action. Already in exile, Pyrrhus was now an orphan as well. In 307 or 306, when Pyrrhus was about 12 years old, Glaucius had him restored to the Epirote throne, whether by military force or by diplomacy is unclear. Pyrrhus would enjoy five peaceful years on the throne, during which he would establish himself as a popular and approachable king. Perhaps the greatest achievement of Pyrrhus and his handlers during this time was to arrange for a marriage alliance between his sister Didamia and Demetrius the Besieger, the son and heir to the most powerful of the successors. By late 302, 
Pyrrhus felt that his power was secure enough in Epirus that he could venture beyond its borders without having to worry about plots being made against him. That year, one of Glaucius's sons was getting married, and Pyrrhus, for both personal and political reasons, wanted to attend the wedding. In his brief absence, Cassander funded another coup and helped to place Neoptolemus II, the son of the aforementioned Neoptolemus and a cousin of Pyrrhus, on the throne. Now landless, Pyrrhus approached his brother-in-law Demetrius and joined up with him just in time to travel to Asia Minor and fight in the Antigonid ranks at the Battle of Ipsus. During his brief time around Antigonus the One-Eyed, Pyrrhus supposedly impressed him to the point that, when the old man was asked to, to name who he thought the greatest soldier of his time was, the king responded, Pyrrhus, if he lives to be old. The story is almost certainly apocryphal, but the fact that ancient readers took it seriously says a great deal about Pyrrhus's reputation for martial prowess. It is not entirely clear whether Pyrrhus fought on foot or on horseback at Ipsus, but it is clear that he demonstrated a mastery of arms and cut down anyone who dared to stand in his path. Whether he commanded a unit or simply wielded his spear, he managed to greatly impress Demetrius and everyone else who witnessed him in action. Most likely, Pyrrhus fought with Demetrius in the cavalry, since that contingent was victorious and escaped the calamity of Ipsus in far greater numbers than the rest of the Antigonid army, which mostly surrendered and got divided between Lysimachus and Seleucus. Despite his brother-in-law's severe setbacks, Pyrrhus remained loyal and campaigned on the besiegers' behalf in Greece, aiding him in taking several cities. Around this time, Demetrius was engaging in diplomacy with Ptolemy. As part of these negotiations, Pyrrhus agreed to go to Egypt as a hostage for Demetrius's good behavior. While he was in Egypt, Pyrrhus had the opportunity to demonstrate his extraordinary physical prowess on the hunt, making a strong impression on Ptolemy. Figuring out that the real key to Ptolemy's favor was through the offices of his second wife, Bernice, who effectively ran the court, Pyrrhus began to make court to her. Pyrrhus made a very positive impression on Bernice, and she decided, despite his lack of immediate prospects, to arrange a marriage between Pyrrhus and her daughter from a previous marriage, Antigone. The marriage between Pyrrhus and Antigone turned out to be a happy one, and they had several children together. After returning from Egypt, Pyrrhus resolved to reclaim his birthright in Epirus. By this juncture, he was a grown man, so now it seems appropriate to speak of his character and appearance. Pyrrhus, almost uniquely, is a historical figure for whom we have information about both his childhood and also a detailed physical description. Rather than looking kingly and distinguished, Pyrrhus instead looked fearsome. His upper teeth were very distinctive in that they were so tightly packed that it looked like a single tooth with lines drawn on. From the time of his first reign as a teenager, Pyrrhus claimed to have the ability to heal. Any suppliant, no matter how poor or humble, could come to Pyrrhus if he or she had a spleen issue, sacrifice a white cock as a gift, and then have Pyrrhus press his right foot on the spleen of the suffering. While the idea of a healing touch became part of royal lore in Western Europe during the Middle Ages, the idea seems to have been rather more novel in Pyrrhus's own time. It seems to be a part of the larger Hellenistic trend toward a more divine conception of kingship. One wonders if Pyrrhus was a brilliant propagandist, or whether he was merely hinting that his own birth and origins might involve the intervention of the gods, just like his legendary cousin. It's also simply possible that he claimed some sort of descent from the god Asclepius. At any rate, we simply don't quite know. Now having enough money to raise an army, Pyrrhus gathered troops and headed home to Epirus. While Plutarch tells us that many Epirotes were glad to see him return, the fact that he did not simply oust his cousin seems to speak to a combination of divided loyalties among the Epirote elite and a lack of overwhelming military strength on Pyrrhus's part. In one of the few instances of diplomacy in his long political career, 
Pyrrhus reached an agreement with Neoptolemus II that the two of them would share power in Epirus as co-kings, presumably a throwback to the 350s when the two royal brothers, the progenitors of the two current kings, had shared power. While the earlier co-rule of Neoptolemus I and Erebus had been harmonious, the relationship between Pyrrhus and Neoptolemus II was always contentious. As was all too typical for aristocrats in the broader Greek world, members of the Epirot elite began seeking their own interest by trying to sow dissent between the two ruling cousins. If Plutarch is right, Neoptolemus II caved into the pressure first and attempted to persuade Pyrrhus's cupbearer to poison him. The cupbearer, however, instead told Pyrrhus about this plot and Pyrrhus decided to eliminate his cousin. First, Pyrrhus gathered evidence of his cousin's treachery so that he could defend his actions before the Epirotes. Next, he invited his cousin to meet him and perform a sacrifice together. When Neoptolemus II arrived, perhaps wondering how long it would take for the poison to run its course, Pyrrhus murdered him, most likely with his own hand. Although Plutarch does not bring up this deed again in his narrative, one has to imagine that Neoptolemus II's supporters although cowed by Pyrrhus's evidence and boldness, would have harbored resentment and served as a latent threat to the stability of Epirus for years to come. Now entrenched in his power, Pyrrhus began to build up the state in his own image like a true Hellenistic monarch. To honor his powerful father-in-law, Pyrrhus named his eldest son Ptolemy and built a new city on the peninsula of Epirus named Berenicus in honor of his mother-in-law. Around 295, Antigone died, and so Pyrrhus took new wives in order to strengthen his ties abroad. The first wife he took was Lanassa, the daughter of King Agathocles of Syracuse, whose dowry was the island of Corsaira. The couple had a troubled relationship, and Lanassa was deeply offended by Pyrrhus's polygamy. Lanassa gave Pyrrhus at least one more son named Alexander. In 292, Pyrrhus also married Burkina, the daughter of Bartolus II of the Dardanian Kingdom, an Illyrian nation which may have had some Thracian intermingling. Another son, Hellenus, was either the son of Lanassa or Burkina. At some point, Pyrrhus acquired two other unnamed wives. It appears that he never had more than three wives at once, however, since Lanassa divorced Pyrrhus in 292 or 291, claiming that he treated his barbarian wives better. It was also around the time of Antigone's death that Pyrrhus relocated his capital city to Ambracia. It would appear that Pyrrhus was aware of the need to build up a strong power base at home, yet he never threw himself into the work of state building and instead engaged in these activities to bide his time until the situation in Macedon offered him an opening. Keep in mind, with the troublesome Neoptolemus II dead and gone, Pyrrhus, the Se Pyrrhus of Epirus was now the closest re living relative of Alexander the Great outside of the Antipatrid dynasty. In 297, the long-suffering Cassander died of dropsy and was succeeded by his oldest son, Philip IV, who was also in poor health. Later that same year, after approximately six months, Philip IV fell dead. At this time, the Kingdom of Macedon fell into a state of civil war between Cassander's younger sons, Antipater and Alexander. Unlike Philip, who had some sense and experience, Antipater and Alexander were young, impetuous, naive, and blind to the dangerous ambitions of their neighbors. Antipater, the older of the two teenage claimants, first eliminated his own mother, Thessalonica, who presumably favored Alexander's claim to the throne. Thessalonica's death is significant, since she was the last living child of Philip II, thus creating simultaneously a pretext for intervention and moving Pyrrhus ever closer to the cherished status of being the closest living relative to Alexander the Great. Now in exile, Alexander the Antipatrid Prince sought foreign aid from Demetrius and Pyrrhus. 
Demetrius was busy in Greece at this time and could not answer the summons quickly, so Alexander was forced to rely on Pyrrhus. In exchange for his military aid, Pyrrhus was slated to receive two districts of Macedon and the Macedonian holdings in Ambracia, Acarnania, and Amphilochia. Securing his new territories first, Pyrrhus then moved to Macedon to plant Alexander on the throne. Antipater turned to Lysimachus for aid, but as usual, the problems of Thrace were too great for him to risk an extended foreign venture. However, Lysimachus had designs on Macedon and wanted to prevent Pyrrhus from capturing the throne. Lysimachus, who had a reputation for military genius, resorted to a ruse to rid himself of Pyrrhus. Forging a fake letter from Pyrrhus's friend and benefactor Ptolemy, Lysimachus urged Pyrrhus to accept a payment of 300 talents from Antipater and go home without helping Alexander. However, while Pyrrhus of Epirus was not the smartest of the successors, he had gotten to know Ptolemy well enough to recognize the letter as a fake based on the salutation. Knowing that he could not defeat Lysimachus in a head-to-head -head military contest if it came to that, Pyrrhus tried to arrange a three-way truce and partition of Macedon with Lysimachus and Antipater. At a sacrifice of a goat, bull, and ram, which was presumably part of his preparation to sign an oath before the gods, the ram died suddenly. The prophet Theodotus, who was present, interpreted the ram's death as being a sign that one of the three kings involved in the partition would die soon. Since the partition did not involve Pyrrhus directly, he was acting on behalf of Alexander, he saw no danger to himself and decided to discard the peace deal that he himself had initiated and strive to acquire a greater hold on Macedon. While Pyrrhus was holding out for better terms, Demetrius finally arrived to aid Alexander. By this juncture, there was no active fighting and Alexander could hardly afford to cede more territory after what he had lost to his brother and signed away to Pyrrhus. However, Demetrius was on the scene and he had high hopes both for himself and the more mundane problem of paying all the men he had brought along with him. Alexander greeted Demetrius with faux hospitality holding a banquet for him. The two leaders plotted against one another and Demetrius managed to have Alexander assassinated at one of the banquets after which he declared himself to be the new king of Macedon in 294. This, of course, changed everything. In the years since Pyrrhus had followed Demetrius to Ipsus, the two men had drifted apart, and they were now hostile to one another. Pyrrhus's sister, Didamia, who had helped Demetrius and Pyrrhus stay on good terms, had died at some point between 301 and 294. Plutarch says that the two men had never seen eye to eye, and hence that they may have butted heads when Pyrrhus served under Demetrius in Greece. However, if Plutarch is to be believed, the real cause of enmity between Pyrrhus and Demetrius was not some personal animus, but rather the allure of the kingdom of Macedon, where both rulers had footholds, but were not content with partition. In the war between Pyrrhus and Demetrius, Demetrius took the initiative. Demetrius acted first to subdue the Aetolians and then invade Epirus from the south, leaving his best general Pantocus behind in Aetolia. Pyrrhus marched out with the intention of intercepting Demetrius, but somehow the two armies failed to meet one another. While Demetrius searched Epirus for Pyrrhus's army, Pyrrhus encountered Pantocus. The fight promised to be a fierce slugfest between the Epirotes and Macedonians, so both Pyrrhus and Pantocus wished to avoid unnecessary bloodshed by resolving the issue with a duel. For Pyrrhus, as a king to accept a duel, was borderline insane and shows the extent of his desire to imitate Alexander. In the duel, Pyrrhus suffered one wound but inflicted two, and Pantocus had to be removed from the field by his friends. This duel did not decide the battle, but in the absence of the Macedonian general, and with Epirote morale bolstered by their king's valor, Pyrrhus's men broke the Macedonian phalanx and took 5,000 prisoners. The Macedonians normally resented anyone who defeated them, but they seem to have been genuinely impressed by Pyrrhus's bravery and willingness to hazard personal risk. As he had intended, 
the Macedonians recognized the similarities that he had to Alexander, whereas most of the Macedonians, including the aging successors, now limited their Alexander imitations to forced head tilts, attire, and coins, Pyrrhus alone had captured the fighting spirit of Alexander. However, as we shall see, winning the admiration of the Macedonians and winning their loyalty were two very different endeavors. At home in Epirus, this victory over Pantacus earned Pyrrhus the nickname Eagle and undoubtedly helped to cement his legitimacy. Soon after this, Pyrrhus received news that Demetrius was ill, and so he invaded Macedon, hoping for a quick victory. Unfortunately for Pyrrhus, Demetrius recovered more quickly than expected and drove him out of Macedon with considerable losses, probably including the segments of Macedon that Pyrrhus had gained by intervening in the Antipatrid Civil War. In 291 BCE, Pyrrhus's disaffected wife Lanassa returned to Corsaira and offered both her hand in marriage and the island as a dowry to Demetrius. Demetrius, always eager to acquire wealthy wives, accepted, thus depriving Pyrrhus of another possession. Shortly after Pyrrhus's Macedonian venture failed, Demetrius used his power as the king of Macedon to raise up a massive army and fleet, aiming to reestablish his father's empire. Predictably, the formation of this massive force sufficiently frightened Demetrius's enemies and caused them to form another grand anti-Antigonid coalition. Having resisted the urging of Ptolemy and others to continue to fight against Demetrius, Pyrrhus now joined forces with the other successors to battle Demetrius. Pyrrhus would invade Macedon from the south, Lysimachus was set to invade Macedon from the north, and Ptolemy's fleet would attack Demetrius's coastal holdings in Greece. The allies put together a formidable fighting force, but it was not so much their martial skill as Demetrius's own unpopularity that destroyed his cause. Aware that he had incurred great unpopularity, Demetrius decided to avoid facing Lysimachus, a former bodyguard of Alexander, and instead bolster his popularity by fighting Pyrrhus of Epirus. Little did Demetrius know, however, that Alexander visited Pyrrhus in a dream prior to the campaign and gave him advice on where to march first. Before the two armies faced each other, Pyrrhus dispatched a number of men to pose as fake Macedonian soldiers and go out among Demetrius's men and spread stories of Pyrrhus's valor and virtue. To signify their allegiance to Pyrrhus, these men and the Macedonians they won over to their cause placed sticks on their helmets to pay homage to Pyrrhus's distinctive battle helmet, which featured goat horns. Since the mass adoption of sticks occurred as the armies were entering battle array, Demetrius noticed that he had lost control and fled the scene. One has to imagine that this was the very danger that Demetrius was trying to avoid and why he had opted to fight Pyrrhus before fighting Lysimachus. A little later, Demetrius took the remainder of his army and attempted to face Lysimachus, expecting better results for whatever reason, but met with the same result. Stripping down his garrisons in Greece, Demetrius landed with an army in Asia Minor and became a problem for just Lysimachus and his son Agathocles. In the wake of Demetrius's flight from Macedon, both Pyrrhus and Lysimachus found themselves in possession of more territory and new recruits. In theory, Lysimachus had the power to crush Pyrrhus and drive him from the southern and western portions of Macedon, but due to the pressing problem of Demetrius in Asia Minor, Lysimachus agreed to a division of the country between them in 288 BCE. This marks Pyrrhus's first tenure as king of Macedon. As Plutarch notes, both kings regarded the agreement as more of a truce than a lasting agreement, and both of them possessed unbounded ambition and wanted the entire thing. During this period of uneasy peace with Lysimachus, Pyrrhus first marched to Athens where he was invited to sacrifice to Athena on the Acropolis and then speak before the assembly. To undermine the relationship that Demetrius had long enjoyed with the Athenians, he enjoined them to safeguard their liberty by never again inviting a king to visit their city or enjoy the kind of hospitality that he himself had just received. 
returning to Thessaly, Pyrrhus fought to suppress a revolt. Plutarch claims that Pyrrhus provoked this revolt so that it would keep his Macedonian troops occupied, but it seems just as likely that the revolt was driven by resentment over Pyrrhus establishing hegemony over them, or a revolt that was funded by Lysimachus to make sure that Pyrrhus didn't entertain any designs on northern Macedon or Thrace. Around 285, Lysimachus's son Agathocles managed to cut off Demetrius from his supplies and then shadowed him south towards Cilicia and Seleucus's empire. Once Demetrius was gone and it was clear that he was going to make war on Seleucus rather than returning to Asia Minor, Lysimachus felt sufficiently powerful to break the peace with Pyrrhus and unite Macedon. Lysimachus sent letters to key Macedonian officers and spread rumors about Pyrrhus, about Pyrrhus, most of which disparaged Pyrrhus for his Epirote heritage and argued that as Macedonians, they should never have to follow the orders of anyone who didn't share their heritage. Once again, Macedonian identity politics proved to be a weapon more devastating than any battlefield weapon or tactic of the day, and Pyrrhus' Macedonian troops melted away. Pyrrhus and his Epirotes evacuated their holdings in Macedon and Thessaly and went home empty-handed in 284. Four years after his return to Epirus, Pyrrhus learned about the plight of Tarentum, a Greek city in Italy that was struggling to keep itself free from the growing political orbit of Rome. While most of the Tarentine upper classes were willing to acquiesce to Rome, the Democratic Party in Tarentum was aware that Rome was inherently oligarchical and that there was no chance of democracy being maintained since the city's oligarchic faction would always have the support of Roman legions. Therefore, and ironically, the best course of action for saving democracy was to call in a foreign king for military aid. An experienced and accomplished commander, recently freed up from his obligations in Macedon, and hailing from a kingdom on the Adriatic coast with a somewhat recent history of Italian intervention, Pyrrhus was the best available option. To prepare for his arrival, Pyrrhus dispatched Cineus, the Thessalian, as his envoy to win over the other Greek cities in Italy and build an anti-Roman alliance. According to Plutarch, before Cineus left, he and Pyrrhus had a conversation where Pyrrhus laid out his plans. In no uncertain terms, Pyrrhus said that he intended to use the invitation into Italy as a pretext to conquer Italy and Sicily. He would then strike south and conquer Carthage before returning to claim Greece and Rome, after which he would retire to a life of leisure. Presumably, since all of these conquests would be made against men of the West, Pyrrhus thought that such deeds would place him above Alexander as the greatest king and conqueror of all time. Cineus asked him if there was anything preventing him from enjoying life now, but Pyrrhus had no answer because he was fixated on conquest. Cineus went ahead with 3,000 men to gain allies and secure a transport fleet for Pyrrhus's main force. Pyrrhus embarked with 20 war elephants, 3,000 cavalry, 20,000 infantry, 2,000 archers, and 500 slingers. The crossing of the Adriatic turned out to be far rougher than expected and nearly capsized Pyrrhus's ambition. A storm destroyed some ships while blowing others badly off course. At one point, Pyrrhus himself was thrown overboard and had to be rescued after he washed ashore the next morning. The crossing as a whole was salvaged by the skilled pilots and crew in the fleet and aid from the local Messapians, who rescued 2,000 infantry and two elephants. It is hard to estimate the losses that Pyrrhus suffered but it would appear that the great majority of the men survived the crossing. Most of the horses, however, did not arrive in Italy and had to be replaced with remounts for Pyrrhus's riders. After such a harrowing journey, and with some elements of his force streaming and straggling in for days after the main force's arrival, we can only imagine that this caused some degree of demoralization, disorganization, and delay. When he arrived in Tarentum, Pyrrhus imposed martial law, banning all leisure activities and festivals and instituting a complete military mobilization. Naturally, many Tarentines were deeply upset by this. 
Religious festivals were a key part of the life of any Greek polis, and many citizens regarded them as key to maintaining a good relationship with the gods, not to mention the entertainment and community building value of such affairs. One ancient stereotype about the Greeks of Italy is that they were more leisured and pleasure-seeking than their counterparts in the Greek homeland. Whether they were offended by Pyrrhus's measures or because they were opponents of Tarentum's democratic government, a number of Tarentine citizens fled the city. A Roman army under a consul named Livinus was laying waste to the region of Lucania and on his way to the far south of Italy. Pyrrhus offered to serve as arbiter in the dispute between Rome and Tarentum, but the Romans refused his offer on the grounds that they did not fear him. In reality, the Romans saw Pyrrhus as a pest, and someone who was intruding in matters that did not concern him. They were almost certainly aware of his recent attempt to conquer Macedon, and they seemed to have misinterpreted his failure there as a lack of generalship. The Romans saw that the Greek cities along with the Lucanians and Samnites were defecting to Pyrrhus, thus threatening to undo the progress that they had made over the last several decades. The best option was to defeat Pyrrhus and drive him off, rather than making an agreement with him which would allow him to continue to engage in politicking and inspire more revolts against Rome. Pyrrhus advanced and chose to bivouac at a site between the cities of Pandosia and Heraclea, with the river Cirrus separating his forces from the Romans. When he scouted the Roman camp, Pyrrhus was said to have been amazed by how orderly the Romans were. As a Greek, Pyrrhus was said to have regarded these men as barbarians and expected them to be undisciplined and disorganized. Pyrrhus's men were not concentrated for battle, so he stationed some of his men, probably his Greek auxiliaries, at the best fords of the river Cirrus with his main army in reserve while he awaited his reinforcements. The Romans chose to try to seize the element of surprise and cross before he could get his reinforcements via some unfavorable fords, which gave Pyrrhus the time to advance against the Romans with his cavalry while he left his generals behind to organize the infantry. So began the Battle of Heraclea. Riding up in close formation, Pyrrhus charged against the Romans, who were densely packed into a shield wall. Pyrrhus distinguished himself in this action with his valor and skill, but he was nearly killed by a Roman soldier and had to be rescued by his friends. Now that the infantry was up, Pyrrhus decided to trade his armor with his friend Megacles and fight in the infantry instead, since Pyrrhus liked to be in the thick of the action. Megacles would masquerade as the Epirote king while Epirus fought in the front ranks. The infantry lines traded the advantage seven times with neither Pyrrhus's alliance nor the Romans ceding the field. Finally, Megacles, still dressed as Pyrrhus, went down, and this threatened to cause the entire line to fold. In fact, it is extraordinarily rare in ancient battle accounts for the death or withdrawal of a commanding officer to not result in a rout. Acting quickly, Pyrrhus tossed his helmet aside and revealed himself to his men, thus restoring order and keeping the battle going. Meanwhile, and possibly because they were only now committed, Pyrrhus's elephants made contact with the Roman cavalry. Since the horses had never encountered elephants before, the smell panicked them and they bolted from the field along with their helpless riders. With the flank clear, Pyrrhus ordered his 3,000 Thessalian cavalry to charge the enemy and secure the victory. Thus ended Pyrrhus's first Pyrrhic victory. The numbers of men lost at Heraclea varies greatly between the two surviving accounts. Dionysius of Halicarnassus claims that the Romans lost 15,000 men to Pyrrhus's 13,000, whereas Hieronymus says Rome lost 7,000 and Pyrrhus lost around 4,000. Hieronymus's numbers make a great deal more sense based on the normal portions of battlefield losses and the disproportionate number of casualties that occur once a rout is achieved. At any rate, as Plutarch tells us, the victory was a hollow one because many of the men Pyrrhus lost were among his best troops and officers, most notably the aforementioned Megacles, whom Pyrrhus must have trusted implicitly since he allowed him to wear his armor and possibly even issue orders in his name as if he really were the Epirote king himself. Following this victory, 
Pyrrhus was reinforced by the Lucanians and Samnites, who had already joined forces with him but had not had time to link up prior to the battle at Heraclea. Several more cities defected to his cause, and he was able to advance to within 37 miles of Rome. Pyrrhus thought that Heraclea would cause Rome to reconsider his offer to arbitrate, and he was probably hoping for a pause that would allow him to reorganize his forces and gain more allies. But if so, then he did not understand the Romans. Undeterred, the Romans retained Levinus in command and began to enroll more troops to seek a second battle. Once again, Pyrrhus found himself amazed at the Romans. Pyrrhus's next move shows his concern over his limited resources. He offered to ally with Rome if only the Romans would be willing to give the Tarentines an assurance of non-aggression. Surprisingly, the Romans took this offer seriously and the Senate debated it. Plutarch portrays the situation as if the Romans were afraid to face Pyrrhus again, but it is also possible that some of the senators saw some kind of advantage in delay. At that point, an elderly senator named Appius Claudius, who hadn't played an active part in politics for years, emerged to vent his spleen about what he saw as Roman cowardice. When the Romans had heard about Alexander's conquest, the old man said, they had boasted that he would have achieved nothing in Italy. Such were the Romans of his day. Now, a generation later, the Romans were considering making peace with the king of Epirus, a mere subject of the mighty Macedonians. Appius Claudius concluded by saying that backing down from Epirus would make Rome look vulnerable and invite more revolts and foreign invaders. Having been shamed by the elderly statesmen, the Romans resolved upon moving forward with their plan to challenge Pyrrhus. Cineus scouted the new Roman army, now theoretically under the command of Gaius Fabricius, and found that the Romans had mustered twice as many men as in the previous battle. Pyrrhus ordered Cineus to subvert Gaius Fabricius, whose exact rank and role in Rome is unclear. First, Cineus offered the Roman leader money then tried to intimidate him with the specter of war elephants. During his third conversation with Fabricius, Cineus told him about Greek culture, including Epicurean philosophy. After hearing about Epicurus's teachings, Fabricius laughed and said that he could only hope that the Epirotes and Samnites would adopt these teachings. Pyrrhus, who also thought that philosophy was degenerate, was impressed to the point of developing a full-blown man-crush on Fabricius. Pyrrhus went so far as to offer Fabricius a prominent role in his army as one of his key generals. While his case as being a great captain has some deficiencies, Pyrrhus's courting of Fabricius is very similar to Napoleon's near obsession with Tsar Alexander I, to whom he once offered a marshal's baton. When Fabricius heard the offer, he told Pyrrhus, Sir, this will not be to your advantage, for they who now honor and advise you, when they have had experience of me, will rather choose to be governed by me than by you. Pyrrhus was not offended by this remark, which was probably actually intended as an insult, but rather continued to view Fabricius as a great and honorable man. As was often the case in the Greek world, especially in the Western Greek world, Whenever an individual or state rose to the top of the heap, there was backlash and infighting in the absence of an immediate existential threat. To a large extent, autonomy and freedom for the Greeks amounted to the right to kill each other and their neighbors, sometimes over petty issues and sometimes over regime change. Pyrrhus's doctor decided that he was in a position to make a lot of money from Rome's fear of Pyrrhus, so he wrote to Fabricius and offered to poison the Epirote king for the right price. Fabricius and his colleagues saw this as despicable, and he warned Pyrrhus about the plot. Pyrrhus was once again impressed by Fabricius. To show his appreciation of Fabricius' honorable conduct, he released Roman prisoners of war without a ransom, and then sent Cineus to Rome to reopen negotiations. The Romans, for their part, reciprocated the favor by releasing Tarentine and Samnite prisoners without a ransom, but they had no interest in peace. 
Pyrrhus and the Roman army met for a second contest at a place called Asculum. Plutarch says that Fabricius was one of the co-consuls in command, but our other sources for the battle, Dionysius of Halicarnassus and Cassius Dio, name the Roman consuls as Publius Decius Mus and Publius Sulpicius Severno, or Severio, excuse me. At any rate, each army mustered around 40,000 men. The Romans had learned from hard experience at Heraclea that Pyrrhus's Thessalian cavalry and war elephants were deadly foes and had to counterbalance this in some way. Accordingly, the Romans built anti-elephant wagons and elected to fight on ground that was not conducive to maneuver or horses. At Asculum, the presence of woods and a swift-flowing river negated Pyrrhus's cavalry and elephants, but he was able to use the woods to conceal his slingers, arch archers, and 19 elephants to move around the Roman flank and around the anti-elephant wagons and compress the enemy position. The Romans found themselves in an untenable spot with no real room to maneuver, but still resisted gallantly. Pyrrhus once again fought in the phalanx, but even with his prowess with the spear, he was unable to make any great progress. Ultimately, after a prolonged struggle, the elephants once again determined the battle's outcome. Asculum was a greater victory than Heraclea, as Pyrrhus inflicted 6,000 losses while suffering 3,600 himself. He commented, quite seriously in light of the irreplaceability of the troops that he had brought with him from Epirus, that another such victory would be his ruin. After his second victory at Asculum, Pyrrhus reassessed the situation. While he had twice defeated the Romans, they showed no signs of yielding. Worse, both Pyrrhus and his Roman adversaries seemed to understand that they had the manpower depth to absorb Pyrrhus's worst. Knowing that he had lost many of the high-quality troops that he had brought with him from home and that his local replacements were of lower quality, Pyrrhus was at a loss for how to bring the war to a successful conclusion. When he received word of new opportunities in Sicily and Macedon, Pyrrhus rejoiced because he knew that he had found an honorable excuse to leave Italy. Although his campaign in Italy ultimately ended in failure, this was much more a function of the superior strength of Rome than of Pyrrhus's shortcomings. Pyrrhus's strategy of building a coalition among Rome's disaffected subjects was a sound one, which exposed the weaknesses of its so-called alliance system. Hannibal Barca, who would employ an almost identical strategy 60 years later, was an admirer of Pyrrhus and most likely derived his basic idea for fighting the Romans from reading about Pyrrhus's campaigns. Two promising new opportunities emerged at this time, with the death of Ptolemy Carinus, who had seized the throne of Macedon a couple of years before, that was an option, and there was also an invitation from the Greeks of Sicily. Although holding the Macedonian throne was one of his lifelong ambitions, Pyrrhus saw the opening in Sicily as more promising and opted to go there. He did officially abandon the Tarentines, but he left them with a garrison in the Acropolis of their city. This move left a bitter taste in the mouths of the Tarentines, who now lacked the benefits of Pyrrhus's protection and generalship, but retained the burden of sustaining a garrison and living under martial law. One of the reasons why Pyrrhus saw Sicily as promising is because he was convinced that he had a strong claim to the throne of the island's greatest Greek power. Back in 289 BCE, the tyrant Agathocles of Sicily had died. As a former son-in-law, with at least one son carrying Agathocles' blood, Pyrrhus believed that he had a claim on the Syracusan throne. Earlier tyrants of Syracuse and the Corinthian general Timoleon had united the Sicilian Greeks against Carthage in the past and accumulated great power in the process. The Greeks of Sicily were numerous, prosperous, powerful, and thusly accepted, they possessed the best cavalry in the Greek world. However, the Greeks of Sicily were at least as fractious and permanently divided as their brethren across the Adriatic. The pattern of Greek history in Sicily was one of the divided polis being hard-pressed 
by the Carthaginians based on the west side of the island and uniting to meet the threat. Once they drove back the Carthaginians and began to make positive gains, the Greek would then begin to suspect each other of striving for permanent dominion, which would end their independence. By the time of Pyrrhus's arrival, this pattern had been playing out for around two centuries. Whether Pyrrhus understood the pattern or not is difficult to say. If he did understand the danger, then perhaps he was confident because of the degree of desperation among the Greeks of Sicily. They had offered him a brand new title as King of Sicily, something that would have been unthinkable a generation before. The situation was dire as the Italian mercenaries who had been hired by Agathocles had killed their Greek masters in Masana and established an independent and pro-Carthaginian presence in the north of the island, from which location they launched many devastating raids. These Mamertines and the Carthaginians had Syracuse under siege at that very moment, and if Syracuse were to fall, the balance of power on the island would permanently shift toward Carthage. Once again, Pyrrhus's agent Cineus set up organized an alliance and collected contributions. With a combined Greek and Epirote force of 30,000 infantry, 2,500 cavalry, and 200 ships, Pyrrhus had the resources to lift the siege of Syracuse and defeat the Carthaginian army upon his arrival in late 278. Pyrrhus, always one to count his eggs before they hatched, was so confident after this quick victory that he planned to give the kingdom of Sicily to Hellenus and then returned to Italy to carve out a kingdom for Alexander. Ptolemy, who was governing Epirus in his father's absence, would inherit Epirus and perhaps Macedon and all the rest of the Balkans as well, because Pyrrhus was going to conquer everything. In 277 BCE, Pyrrhus swept most of Sicily clear of a Punic presence. A large number of Carthaginians holed up in Arix, one of their key cities on the island. Undeterred by the dangers of assaulting fortifications containing large garrisons, Pyrrhus himself mounted one of the ladders and cut a swath through the enemy. Prior to this action, Pyrrhus swore to honor Heracles if he captured the city, and he did so by sponsoring a variety of shows and plays. The successes of the last two years, if Plutarch is to be believed, made Pyrrhus hubristic, and he began to behave harshly, alienating his new subjects and losing their loyalty. Of course, Plutarch was convinced that the personal morals of great men were the driving force of history, and he can be dismissed 99% of the time when it comes to determining historical causation. If we recall the pattern of Sicilian Greek history, and keep in mind that they too had grown overconfident in the wake of their recent successes, we can view the breakdown of Pyrrhus's Sicilian kingdom as caused by factors more complex than Pyrrhus's own ego. After a reek, Pyrrhus entered into negotiations with Carthage, where he wanted them to formally cede their holdings in Sicily. The Carthaginians, despite the harshness of the terms, were willing to negotiate. However, Pyrrhus's Greek subjects urged him to eject the Carthaginians from Lilibium on the western coast, the other great Punic stronghold. Accordingly, and realizing that without the support of his subjects his power was nothing, Pyrrhus broke off his negotiations and marched on Lilibium. After two months of trying to pierce the walls in vain, Pyrrhus realized that he would not be able to seize the city without being able to assault the city's harbor as well. When he asked for more financial contributions from his Greek subjects, however, they balked, and he had to resort to installing garrisons to ensure that he got his money and supplies. Needless to say, this stirred up heavy resentment and caused his subjects to view him more as a tyrant, in the modern sense, than as a king. Growing paranoid about two prominent Syracusans who had invited him to Sicily, Pyrrhus tried to have both of them executed, but only ended up catching one of them. This action spurred on a revolt by both his Greek and Mamertine subjects. Some of the Greeks were so enraged by the aforementioned abuses that some of them sent envoys to Carthage and offered to ally against Pyrrhus. Emboldened by the Greek overtures, Carthage assembled another mercenary army and sent it against Pyrrhus at Lilibium. Pyrrhus seems to have won this battle rather easily. However, even this major victory did not squelch dissent, and the revolt spread. 
Once again at a strategic dead end, Pyrrhus began to search for an honorable exit from Sicily. In 276 BCE, as if on cue, letters arrived from the Samnites and Tarentines who had been getting pounded by the Romans. By this point, Tarentum was the last Greek city that had retained its independence. Pyrrhus decided at once to pack up his troops and return to Italy. As he embarked, Pyrrhus observed to his friends that they were leaving behind a land which would soon become a great wrestling ring between Rome and Carthage. While his fleet of 110 warships was crossing from Sicily to Italy, escorting his heavily laden transports, the worst fear of any ancient admiral was realized when a Carthaginian fleet appeared and forced an engagement. The transports made a run for Locri, which was closer than their intended destination of Regium. In the meantime, Pyrrhus's warships turned to do battle with the Carthaginians. While the Greeks usually bested the Carthaginians on land, the opposite was typically true at sea. The Battle of the Strait of Masana was not an exception to the norm. The Punic fleet sank 70 ships, disabled and probably towed off 28, and only 12 of Pyrrhus's ships were able to escape to Locri with the transports. Some of these ships were Pyrrhus's own, while others belonged to his allies. At any rate, this defeat was severe enough to prevent Pyrrhus from returning to Sicily ever again. This naval catastrophe mirrors the trouble with storms that Pyrrhus had had when he had originally come to Sicily some five years earlier, just as that storm had presaged the troubles that he would have in Italy, so too did this massive naval defeat presage further difficulties that he would now experience in Italy. The Carthaginians had gotten some measure of revenge with that battle, and now the Mamertines wanted to get even as well. Pyrrhus's march back to Tarentum would end up being far more perilous than he could have anticipated. The Mamertines landed in Italy and then avoided open battle with Pyrrhus, but instead used the terrain to their advantage to launch ambushes and attack the Epirote rear guard. Some of these attacks took out substantial numbers of men and even killed two elephants. During one of these hit-and-run attacks, Pyrrhus happened to be near his rear guard when it happened, and he engaged the Mamertines personally, repelling their attack, but he suffered a sword wound to the head in the process. When a large Mamertine challenged him if he was still alive and questioned his manhood, a blood-soaked Pyrrhus shoved his friends and guards aside and went out to meet his challenger. Pyrrhus hit the Mamertine so hard that he nearly cleaved him in half vertically, this extraordinary display of power thoroughly demoralized the Mamertine enemy. Pyrrhus eventually made it to Tarentum with 20,000 infantry, 3,000 cavalry, and 10 war elephants. He supplemented this force with the best soldiers of Tarentum and then marched to Samnium where the Romans had two consular armies in the field and the Samnites were on the verge of complete collapse. The exact course of events during the ensuing campaign and battle is unclear, since Plutarch, Dionysius of Halicarnassus, and Cassius Dio all provide somewhat different versions of the Battle of Beneventum. Here, I will provide something of a composite sketch of the battle using all three accounts and a bit of guesswork. Pyrrhus dispatched a small portion of his army to march against one consul and keep him occupied so that he wouldn't combine forces with Manius Curius Dentatus, against whom Pyrrhus marched with his main force. Due to Pyrrhus's abandoning them for Syracuse for the last few years, the Samnites did not turn out in great numbers to aid him. Pyrrhus wished to have the element of surprise on his side against Dentatus' army, so he marched through the woods along paths that Dionysius of Halicarnassus described as goat paths. This march disorganized and slightly demoralized his men, while their emergence from the woods was too clumsy to avoid Roman notice. Pyrrhus advanced from higher ground and Dentatus aggressively moved forward to meet him. At first, Pyrrhus's infantry and elephants pressed Dentatus back to his fortified camp, where he was able to rally his men and restore the line. No Roman fortified camp was ever seized by an assault and Beneventum was no exception. At some point in the fighting, the Romans wounded or frightened a young elephant which began running around looking for its mother. This elephant ran amok, 
panicking the other pachyderms and wreaking havoc in the upper oat ranks. The Romans then counterattacked and won the day, inflicting heavy losses, including killing two elephants and capturing the other eight. If Plutarch's assessment is correct, then Pyrrhus's defeat at Beneventum was the event which gave Rome the feeling of invincibility that it needed to allow it to complete the conquest of Italy and then embark on the First Punic War about a decade later, perhaps even sooner than Pyrrhus had predicted. Thus, by 274, Pyrrhus was back in Epirus and had nothing to show for his Italian escapades except for a garrison in Tarentum and new scars. Despite these failures, Plutarch tells us that Pyrrhus was now the most famous king in the greater Macedonian world, and that neither his courage nor his ambition had faded in the slightest. Of the uproots who had accompanied the king in Italy and Sicily, only 8,000 infantry and 500 cavalry returned home. To retain the services of even this reduced force, Pyrrhus would need to return to war soon after his arrival in order to secure money. Joining forces with some Gauls, who found themselves without a paymaster since King Antigonus II Gennadus had not hired all of them, Pyrrhus embarked on a raid of Macedon to gain some quick plunder. However, this raid turned into a full-scale invasion, as it went far better than he could have hoped. After taking several towns and having 2,000 men defect to him, Pyrrhus began to entertain the hope of seizing the throne from Antigonus. A son of Demetrius and grandson of both Antipater and Antigonus the One-Eyed, Antigonus II Gennadus was a wise ruler who had filled the void left by the death of Ptolemy Carinus. While he possessed foresight, an impeccable pedigree, and brains in abundance, one thing that Antigonus II lacked was the spirit of a warrior or any appreciable military skill. This was a turnoff for many Macedonians accustomed to living under bold and skilled warrior kings. Pyrrhus, whose political stock had risen due to his western adventures, thought that he could exploit Antigonus's great weakness and become king of Macedon once again. Antigonus met Pyrrhus at a mountain pass, where Pyrrhus managed to rout Antigonus's forces. The Gauls who worked for Antigonus managed to cover their king's retreat, and after fighting well, they were cut off from the Macedonians. Along with Antigonus's elephant corps, this group of Gauls surrendered and joined Pyrrhus. Antigonus regrouped and offered battle a second time. This time, there was not much of a fight, as Antigonus's men were afraid to fight Pyrrhus, and all of the men and junior officers defected as a body. Pyrrhus was now king of virtually all of Macedon, with Antigonus clinging to life in a handful of ports. Once again, Pyrrhus's lack of talent outside of the narrow confines of the battlefield caused him to begin sowing the seeds of his own failure as soon as the crown was placed upon his head. Seizing all of the towns in Macedon and rewarding his men, including the Gauls, Pyrrhus allowed something that was unforgivable in Macedonian eyes. Allowing the Gauls to garrison Aji, the ceremonial capital and burial site of the Argead kings down to Philip II, Pyrrhus turned a deaf ear to reports that the Gauls were engaging in tomb robbing and other disrespectful activities. Naturally, such conduct made the Macedonians miss Antigonus, and so Pyrrhus tried to challenge his manhood by demanding to know how Antigonus still dared to wear purple, given how little territory he held. Despite his best taunts, Pyrrhus was not able to get Antigonus to come out and face him again because Antigonus was more of a philosopher than a warrior. As always, Pyrrhus had no real plan to use the great power that he had just acquired, and he was just looking for another opportunity to fight more battles elsewhere. In Sparta, there was a power struggle between the dual monarchs, Arius and Cleonymus. Cleonymus, the Aegean king, was an old man who had taken a young wife named Chalanus. Predictably, the young lady was more attracted to a man closer to her own age. This young man turned out to be Acrotatus, the son of Arius, from the Eurypontid line of kings. Cleonymus urged Pyrrhus to come to Sparta to aid him against Arius, by which he presumably meant eliminating the Eurypontids, Gerusia, and Ephors to leave him in full control of Sparta. What Cleonymus offered Pyrrhus is unclear. But Plutarch says that Pyrrhus aimed to take the entire Peloponnese. 
While 3rd century Sparta was a shadow of its classical self, it was still a regional power, and since the Spartans had eschewed outside alliances, Pyrrhus saw an opportunity to be the first Macedonian king to make an ally in Sparta. Raising 25,000 infantry, 2,000 cavalry, and 24 elephants, Pyrrhus marched to Sparta to aid Cleonymus, and also under the more laughable pretext of sending his younger sons to Sparta for a proper education. When he entered Laconia, the district around Sparta, Pyrrhus began to lay waste, which drew protests from the Spartans who complained that he was not fighting fairly since he had not sent a herald or declared war. Cleonymus sent a private message to Pyrrhus urging him to march on the city post haste since Arius was away with some of Sparta's troops in Crete on mercenary service. Pyrrhus, however, was overconfident and thought that the Spartans would not dare fight him, so he encamped in front of the city. That night, the traitor Cleonymus had his household slaves prepare a great dinner for the following day, when he planned to host Pyrrhus. That day, however, as the Spartans and the Gerousia debated on what to do and whether or not they should send the women away to Crete, a royal woman named Archidamia entered the council chamber holding a sword and declared that Spartan women refused to survive the ruin of their home city. That night, the men of fighting age rested while women of all ages and men too old for battle erected an obstacle for elephants and a makeshift trench. The next morning, Pyrrhus attacked the Spartan positions. Leading his men in a head-on assault against the trench, he found it almost impossible to make progress since the earth was fresh and loose. Meanwhile, Pyrrhus's oldest son, Ptolemy, led 2,000 Gauls and some Greek allies around the trench to remove the wagons that were blocking their path of advance. This part of Sparta was on low ground with poor visibility, so Prince Acrotatus with 300 men who were presumably being held in reserve, were able to strike Ptolemy by surprise and rout him. This deed inspired all of the Spartan defenders and caused men to cheer on Acrotatus's adulterous relationship with Chalanus, which was apparently public knowledge. During this first day's fighting, Pyrrhus was always in the thickest of it and fought as valiantly and skillfully as ever. That night, Pyrrhus had a dream about lightning bolts splashing down across Sparta, his friends saw this as a bad omen, but Pyrrhus was encouraged by the dream and convinced that the city was destined to fall to him. During the second day of fighting, Pyrrhus tried to fill in the trench and then cross over, work that he was not able to accomplish, but that he was able to make considerable progress toward, since most of the Spartan troops were either wounded or exhausted. Spartan women rushed around feverishly behind the battle lines, bringing food and water to soldiers while others cared for the wounded. Late in the day, Pyrrhus mounted his horse and leapt over the trench, joined on the other side by a small force which tried to force their way into the city. Pyrrhus was shot off his horse and his small band was repelled. After this harrowing escape, Pyrrhus ended the day's fighting after a few hours before dark because he was convinced the Spartans were completely out of options and that they would come to their senses and surrender the next morning. However, that very night, the Spartans ended up receiving much needed reinforcements. One of Antigonus's generals led a force of mercenaries from Corinth, while Ar Arius returned earlier than expected from Crete with 2,000 troops. All of these men were admitted to the city. Far from being defeated, the Spartans were now too strong to assault in light of the losses that Pyrrhus had already suffered in the fierce actions of the first two days at Sparta. Retreating from the city, he laid waste to Laconia and started planning to spend the winter there to renew his effort to seize Sparta in the spring. Unsurprisingly, when a new opportunity emerged, Pyrrhus abandoned Laconia at once, and Argos, there was a civil war where one faction had summoned Antigonus, thus driving the other side to reflexively call for Pyrrhus' help. Perhaps fearing a revival of Antigonus's power and influence, or perhaps just having an inability to refrain from engaging in every potential conflict, Pyrrhus marched to Argos. During his retreat, Pyrrhus's rear guard was harassed by Arius. Pyrrhus sent Ptolemy to deal with the Spartans, and he was killed in single combat. Enraged, 
Pyrrhus rode to the rear and engaged his son's murderer, running him through with a spear before rejoining his Epirote cavalry for a charge which broke the Spartans. Pyrrhus then dismounted and long continued to vent his fury in what became a massacre of his Spartan pursuers. Plutarch judges this action to have been Pyrrhus's greatest display of courage and might. Arriving at Argos, Pyrrhus found another difficult challenge. Antigonus, whose army was a good deal smaller but still potentially dangerous, held the high ground near Nauplia, so it would be costly to assault him there. Further, the Argives had seen the error of involving foreign kings in their civil dispute, and they requested that both kings go home. Antigonus offered a son as a hostage to prove his good intentions, but Pyrrhus offered nothing. The two kings exchanged insults with one another all the while, since they by now thoroughly despised one another. Pyrrhus had an ally inside Argos who opened up one of the main gates one night and allowed Pyrrhus to enter. However, while the Gauls were able to seize the Agora, things started to fall apart when Pyrrhus insisted on pulling the towers off of his elephants to fit them within the city. This delay, coupled with the narrow gates and narrow streets and the darkness, allowed the Argives time to mobilize around their acropolis called the Aspis and send for aid. Arius and Antigonus were in the region, and both of them struck Pyrrhus from the rear, which necessitated leaving Hellenus outside of the gates with a large portion of the troops. Since it was night, no one could meaningfully command, and all sides spent a sleepless night waiting for the first light. At daybreak, Pyrrhus saw that he had lost his chance to take the city by surprise, since the Aspis was now crawling with defenders. He decided to fall back and sent orders to Hellenus to level a section of the wall so that he wouldn't get trapped while passing through the narrow city gates. Meanwhile, Pyrrhus happened to spot a dedication in the Agora, featuring a fight between a wolf and a bear, a bull, which reminded him of an oracle which said that he would die once he had seen a wolf fight a bull. The messenger whom Pyrrhus dispatched bungled the orders and instead told Hellenus to bring up all of his men. Hellenus then came into the city with all of his men and created even more congestion and confusion, a situation that was compounded when one of the elephants fell under the gate and obstructed the movement of Pyrrhus's men. Now dangerously compacted into the Agora, Pyrrhus and his men were attacked by Argive men in the streets and by Argive women on the rooftops raining down rocks and roof tiles. Pyrrhus removed his crown and rode into the thickest of the fighting. One Argive soldier succeeded in piercing Pyrrhus's breastplate with his spear, but he did not inflict a wound on the king. Pyrrhus turned on him and ran him through in turn. This man's mother happened to be on the roof of a nearby building, and she hurled a roof tile down at Pyrrhus, which struck him on the neck below his helmet, smashing one or more of his vertebrae and paralyzing him. He then tumbled off of his horse. One of Antigonus's men recognized Pyrrhus and dragged him inside of a nearby building to finish him off. Pyrrhus recovered from his dazed condition to glance at the man with his trademark savage glare, and this was enough to frighten his would-be killer off for a moment, but eventually the man regained his composure and decapitated Pyrrhus in a sloppy manner. Pyrrhus's head was brought to Antigonus' son Alcyonius, who then proudly displayed it to his father. Antigonus II Gennatus was disgusted by the sight of his enemy's severed head and began to feel pity for the sons of the departed king. He himself had lost both his father and his grandfather in ways that had haunted him for years, so he ordered Alcyonius to return Pyrrhus's ashes to Hellenus while in disguise. The battle at Argos restored Antigonus II to the throne of Macedon, and he reacquired all of the Macedonian troops who had defected to Pyrrhus. He decided to err on the side of leniency and generosity, since he rewarded and retained Pyrrhus's chief lieutenants among the Macedonians. And what was almost certainly also motivated by a desire to keep his pro-Pyrrhus Macedonian troops happy, Antigonus II helped Hellenus get home to Epirus and keep the throne there thus ensuring the survival of the Molossian dynasty. 
Hannibal, when he was ranking the greatest commanders of all time in terms of skill and conduct, ranked himself third, his rival Scipio Africanus second, and Pyrrhus of Epirus first. One can only hope for Pyrrhus's sake that he was actually that good as a soldier in general, since this was the only area of human activity where he actively strove for excellence. Once, when he was asked who he thought was the best musician, Pyrrhus responded by naming Polyperchon as the best soldier, indicating that war was the only thing that he deemed important. I can't help but speculate that Pyrrhus's obsession with war stemmed from his traumatic childhood experiences, where he himself, his family, and his homeland were bullied by stronger neighbors. Despite the testimony of Hannibal, in truth, it is dis difficult to assess Pyrrhus as a general vis-a-vis -vis his more powerful ancient rivals who had vastly superior resources and opportunities. For my part, I think that Pyrrhus was a fine tactician and a highly skilled soldier, but as a strategist he falls far short of great captains like Alexander, Caesar, Scipio, and Hannibal. A poor diplomat who never cultivated many talented subordinates Pierce's ability to achieve lasting victories was limited. When grand strategy is taken into account, I have to rate Pierce's overall generalship below that of Philip II, Seleucus I, and Trajan. Someone whose name is synonymous with a hollow victory that fails to advance one's own strategic aims simply cannot be in the running for greatest general of an era in the presence of such competition. Had Pyrrhus lived much longer, surely age and his many wounds would have caught up with him sooner rather than later. He was already 46 or 47 when he died, and it is hard to imagine a commander who depended so much on his personal heroics continuing to enjoy success as an old man. Whatever his defects as a general, Pyrrhus still has to be considered among the greatest warriors who have ever lived, and he has a better case than any ancient European for being shoehorned into the next Dynasty Warriors game. Despite his incessant war-making and his ruthless conduct when dealing with his cousin Neoptolemus II, Pyrrhus was normally calm, relatively mild-mannered by the standards of ancient kings, generous, and he had a sense of humor. Once when an Ambracian was brought before him on charges of having slandered him at a drinking party, Pyrrhus asked the accused whether the charges were true. The Ambracian responded that he had said all of the things that he was accused of saying and would have said more if he had just had more wine and more time. Pyrrhus laughed, perhaps refreshed by the man's honesty and bluntness, and dismissed him without inflicting any punishment. Pyrrhus's successes as a general, the numerous anecdotes about his high character, and his amazing feats as a warrior should not blind us to his outsized flaws. A man with unlimited ambition, Pyrrhus does not seem to have appreciated the need for patience, planning, and accumulated resources to back up his boldness and skill. Essentially a parody of Alexander the Great, Pyrrhus greatly exceeded his cousin's personal boldness and feats of strength while failing to appreciate Alexander's grand strategy or his attempts to win over the Persian people. All truly great kings are also great politicians. Pyrrhus, however, as we have seen, struggled to win and retain support outside of his native Epirus. Pyrrhus did not realize that his maternal kinship to Alexander was not a guarantee of acceptance for his bid for the Macedonian throne. Pyrrhus never managed to unite the Greeks of Italy and Sicily, despite coming to them as a savior at one of the darkest hours in their history, a time when more and more Greeks were becoming comfortable with the idea of large-scale monarchies. The task, to be fair, was not an easy one. But unlike in previous generations, it was feasible. Pyrrhus, however, was a below average ruler. Pyrrhus's last great opponent, Antigonus II Gennadus, summed up the Epirote king's failings most accurately when he compared Pyrrhus to a dice player who had excellent throws but no idea how to use them. <laughs>